The Buddha set out a triple training, what he called training in heightened virtue, training in heightened mind, which means concentration, and training in heightened discernment. When you hear that list, it seems like you have to perfect your virtue first, and then you go to your concentration, and then you perfect your concentration before you can develop discernment. But in practice, that's not how it happens. All three have to help one another. For instance, sometimes you don't really see the, the harm that's caused by breaking the precepts until you start meditating. Your mind gets more sensitive. And you see that it really does disturb the mind to break the precepts. And because you begin to value your concentration, it gives you that much more strength in observing the precepts. Similarly with discernment. It's not the case that you get the mind still and then you start working on discernment. It happens sometimes. But there are other times when you can't really get the mind to settle down until you understand what's going on in the mind, particularly if you have a lot of thoughts that are pulling you away, that are crowding in. And you have to clear some space. And you can't just will them away or force them away. Sometimes you can, but there are a lot of times when you can't. And that's the time when you have to understand them. Just so you can see through them, and then you can put them aside, let the mind settle down. When the Buddha talks about understanding your thoughts, there are five steps. The first one is to see them arise. This is a particularly helpful exercise when you have a state of mind that just seems to be permanently there. Like anger or grief. or a depression. It seems like it, those thoughts are just there all the time. So you can see that they actually arise at one point and fade away at another point. But when you look more carefully, you see that they do. No thought is permanently there. No emotion is permanently there. There is some confusion that's caused by the hormones in the body. Say anger arises, and then it goes. But when it's in force, it gets some hormones churning in your bloodstream. And then even when the anger goes, the hormones are still there. You can very easily read that as a sign that the anger must still be there, and so you dig it up again. So you have to learn how to make a distinction. What is the thought of anger and what are the physical manifestations? When you see something arise, it's not just a matter of watching it's arising. You want to see what sparked it, or in the Buddhist terms, what's the origination? The word samadaya means what comes along with it as a cause. And sometimes you'll see that a particular thought pattern gets triggered by a certain feeling in the body. or a certain perception of the image appears in the mind, and you have associations with that image and you just jump to the thought. You want to see that, because that helps give you some distance. In the same way when the Buddha analyzes the different things with which you could identify as you or yours, particularly as you, what is yourself, he says, if you can see it arise, it can't be yourself. Because if you're here to see it arise, you're here to see it before it arises. And if you're here before it arises, then it can't be the, yourself. Or when you see it pass away, if you're here to see that it's gone, it can't be yourself. That observation should give you some distance. And it's the same with any kind of thought, whether it's specifically a thought of, this is me this is, or this is mine, this is my thought. So it is possible to have something that you say is mine that comes and goes. 
but seeing it come and seeing it go where you thought previously that it was a, a constant hum in the background, that gives you some distance and gives you a handle on it. So those are the first two steps, seeing the rising or the origination, seeing the passing away. No matter how many times it comes into being or passes away, you want to note when it's there and when it's not. When it does come back, what sparked it? And then beyond that, that's the third step is to see the allure. What is it you like about this? Now the liking here may not be saying, well, I just really enjoy this kind of thinking. There may be a sense of compulsion. You feel compelled to think this way. You feel that you ought to think in this way, especially with worries. There's a part of the mind that says, if I don't worry enough, I'm not preparing for the future. And you feel virtuous about worrying. Or with grief. There comes a point where you feel, if I'm not feeling grief, I'm not being loyal to the person or the situation that I've, I've lost. So the allure here may not be a pleasant thing, but a sense of obligation. But notice that. What is it that the mind feeds on that makes it want to go with us again, or feel that it should go with us again, this particular thought? And this is an area where you have to be very honest with yourself, because there are a lot of times we go for a type of thinking that in our conscious minds we say, oh, I don't like this thought, I'm thinking at all, I don't, can't identify with this, this isn't really me. Because it doesn't fit in with your image of yourself. Or if the allure shows a side of you that you don't particularly like, you tend to hide it. When you hide it, you're not really going to understand the thought. You're not going to understand this emotion. You're certainly not going to be able to get past it. Because we can't get past things simply saying, well, they're in constant stress, well, not self, I'll just put them aside. I was talking the other day to someone who's having difficulties, some narratives she keeps telling herself that keep driving her crazy. And said, so you have to remind yourself that this is a narrative. And she says, oh yes, and, but because it's a narrative, I should just not pay attention to it. And I said, no, it's a narrative that you like, part of you likes. And this is where it's good to think of the mind as a committee. There are some committee members that like this. It's only when you ferret out those members that you can do something about them. Because then the fourth step is to really look carefully at the drawbacks of that kind of thing. Where is this going to take you? If you were to think this thought for a day and a night, where would it lead you? If you were to act on it, where would it lead you? If, it was going to, if acting on it meant that you would do something really unskillful, why go with it? It's when it really hits that the allure is pretty meager or pretty embarrassing. And it certainly doesn't compensate for the drawbacks. That's when you get to the fifth step, which is dispassion. You outgrow the thought. It loses its appeal. The Thai Johns like to talk of dispassion basically as growing up. or overcoming an intoxication, you finally sober up and you realize that you've been intoxicated with a particular thought. And now your understanding of that way of thinking is clear. You can step outside it so that the next time it comes back it doesn't have the same appeal. And you've got a greater sense of distance from it. When you can get distance from it, that's when the mind can settle down. There are two ways of getting the mind into concentration, directed and undirected. Undirected is when you see whatever the mind is holding on to. It's not an object of concentration that you want, and you let go of it, 
and the mind settles down on its own without you having to think consciously about the body or feelings or any of the frames of reference. And then this was called directed, which, in which you actually are thinking specifically about the breath, thinking specifically about whatever your meditation topic is. But that undirected approach, that's where you use your discernment to peel away your attachments. And you may not be able to uproot them entirely, but as long as you can step back from them and stop feeding them, because we do feed them with our attention. And when there's a sense that they're not really interesting anymore, they don't really serve a purpose, that's when you stop feeding them. And the mind inclines to come into the present moment. So as you're training yourself, don't wait until your virtue is perfect before you do concentration, and don't wait until your concentration is perfect before you work on discernment. Work on all three. And using discernment here, it requires some thought. Those techniques where they say just note, 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 and you're going to get insight. You gain a certain amount of insight. But it's a lot you're going to miss if you don't look in terms of these five steps. When the Buddha talks about insight, it's always in terms of seeing the origination, seeing the passing away, the allure, the drawbacks, and the escape through dispassion. When you see all those things, that's when you really understand what's going on in the mind. And that's what helps your training become complete.